What's going on ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another video. Now in today's video we're going to be covering task 4 and task 6 so please take out your notebooks, have your writing utensil in hand, and get ready to take notes. Alright, the topic for today's task 4 question is fixed action patterns. Let's look for the topic first within the passage. These responses are fixed action patterns. These responses is telling us that the definition was already given. So let's read the first two sentences. Animals and humans sometimes engage in actions that are virtually impossible to stop once initiated. For example, an animal may receive a stimulus that will cause it, consciously and automatically, to respond with a predictable response, these responses. Okay, so fixed action patterns are predictable responses that are virtually in impossible to stop once initiated. There's the definition. All right, now that we're done um, taking notes for the definition, we don't need to look at the reading passage anymore. So let's move on to the lecture. Listen to a lecture about the same topic and take notes. Sometimes we have no choice in how we respond to something, like yawning. If I talk about it, See? Look how many of you yawn just now. <laughs> That's called a fixed action response. It's more common in animals of, well, lower intelligence than in humans, though. <laughs> Let me illustrate it with a couple of examples. The male stickleback fish gets a bright red and blue belly during its breeding season. Well, it's a very aggressive fish, so if it sees another male with a red stomach, it'll attack that male. However, if you put a red ball near a stickleback, it'll attack the red ball too. You see, it automatically responds to the presence of anything red by attacking. That action is fixed for the stickleback. The gray leg goose provides another example of a fixed action response. These birds sit on their eggs before they hatch. However, sometimes an egg might roll out of the nest. The mother goose simply rolls the egg back into the nest with her long neck and beak. Now, if someone takes the egg away, the goose will continue trying to push an imaginary egg back into her nest. Additionally, if there are any egg-like objects nearby, marbles, stones, or whatever, the goose will try rolling them into her nest as well. All right, now I ran out of space over here. I wanted to write a lot more information, but I'm, I have no choice. I'm not gonna be able to say it because I don't have room, which is perfectly fine. I think this is more than enough information. All right, now I, I was chuckling because the professor said that fixed action responses or fixed action patterns are more common among uh, animals with lower intelligence. So thank God that I didn't yawn when the professor said yawn. <laughs> okay, anyways, um, so yeah, the professor gave us two examples, and uh, as soon as you heard that, you should have been able to organize both the beginning and ending sentences, like so. Read it, write it down, think about why you couldn't organize it, organize those sentences if you couldn't, and make sure that you can in the future. All right, now, the first example was about the male stickleback fish. Now. If you missed this name, which is very likely, you can say a certain type of fish, okay? All right, that's fine. You don't even have to write, you don't even have to mention the male, all right? So I'm just gonna say uh, a certain type of fish, okay? Now over here, I'm gonna say uh, gray-legged geese. I'm gonna say the name for the second animal. However, once again, if you missed the name, you can say a certain type of geese. That's fine as well. Now, for a lecture like this, um, the directions might actually give you the name of the fish and uh, the geese, basically the name of the animals that were mentioned. So if they were mentioned, please catch them and say them. So what do you want? Okay, so yeah, perfect balance. I'll use a certain type of fish here and I'll say uh, gray-legged geese for the second example. All right, so let's look at the first part. Um, a certain type of fish gets a red belly during the mating season and becomes extremely aggressive. Uh, subsequently, it attacks anything red. So this type of behavior is a fixed action for this type of fish or for this species of fish. 
All right, the second example, uh, gray-legged geese sit on their eggs before they hatch. When their eggs roll out of the nest, they roll them back into, into the nest with their beaks. Plus, they continue to do this even when the egg is physically taken away, which means that this behavior is a fixed action response. All right, so that's basically all I'm gonna say over here. Um, the professor did mention a lot of things about how this goose or these geese uh, will continue to roll an imaginary egg or any egg-like circular object with their beaks. Uh, but I'm not gonna mention that because I feel like um, this part right here, even when the egg is physically taken away, um, elaborated on that idea, on that concept pretty sufficiently. All right, but that's my opinion. But since I feel that way, I, feel, I, I don't feel any remorse uh, when not mentioning that information that I just mentioned. All right, now let's listen to my sample response. In the lecture, the professor elaborated on a couple of different examples to explain the concept of fixed action patterns. To begin with, a certain type of fish gets a red belly during the mating season and becomes extremely aggressive. Subsequently, this fish actually attacks anything red. So, this type of behavior is a fixed action for this species of fish. Furthermore, gray-legged geese always sit on their eggs before they hatch. When their eggs roll out of their nests, they roll them back into the nest with their beaks. Plus, they continue to do this even when the egg is physically taken away, which means that this action is a fixed action response for the gray-legged geese. To sum up, these were two perfect examples of fixed action patterns given by the professor in the lecture. Thank you for your time and consideration. All right, so um, I spoke very, very steadily. I had more than enough information from the lecture, which means or which made it so that I only had about 12 seconds left uh, by the time I was done summarizing the listings information. So I didn't even have to use the definition, all right? Now that's perfectly fine because number one, you should never be in a rush when you're speaking a foreign language, all right? So it's my mother tongue, it's my first language, but for you guys, um, if English happens to be your second language, yeah, then you should never rush yourself because of many reasons which I've already mentioned in a previous video, so check it out or think about it logically, okay? Uh, number two, uh, this is more than enough information. I would never ever expect you guys to take notes on more information than this on a regular basis uh, since it's unreasonable, all right? And number three, Three, yeah, one minute is just enough time for you guys to uh, do everything that I want you guys to do, okay? So, um, prioritize the listening's information and your fluency, aka your speaking pace. Uh, and don't feel bad about sacrificing the reading's information, okay? For task three and task four questions. All right, now let's move over to the dreaded task six. Task six does not have a reading passage, so I'm gonna start the lecture pretty soon. Please pause the video and copy the note-taking diagram, which is in red. Now, after how, so next to how, this arrow point right here, you need to first write down a noun, and that's gonna be the subject. So over here, you need to write down a complete sentence, okay? Now, the subject, the noun, which is the uh, main character, is gonna be revealed to us in the introduction of the lecture. So please really listen carefully to the nouns that the professor says and try to realize uh, which is the main character, the protagonist, and write it down as quickly as possible. All right, here's the lecture. Listen to a lecture and take notes. Let's move on to pollination and how flowers attract pollinators. Most flowers get pollinated by insects, so let's focus on that. You've probably noticed that flowers have their own distinct appearances and smells. Don't think those are for your benefit, okay? They actually look and smell those ways in order to attract insects to pollinate them. Allow me to explain in detail. One major attractor, unsurprisingly, is appearance. It's the most important one of all. Some insects can see colors well. So, there are some colors that, depending upon the insect, make it just want to stop and sit down on the flower. For example, many butterflies are attracted to the colors red and yellow, two of the three primary colors. 
Think of the painted daisy. Here's a picture. It's got red petals and a yellow center. Butterflies simply won't miss being attracted to that flower. It's irresistible. So remember, that's why we see so many different colors of flowers. They are attracting various kinds of insects to pollinate them. Odor is the second most common attractor used. Unfortunately for flowers, most insects can't differentiate colors. They're essentially colorblind, but they can recognize different scents, that is, smells. Take the moth. You know, those insects that look like butterflies, but which always appear at night. Well, they're attracted to, um, sweet smells. Jasmine is one example. Now, get a load of this. Jasmine produces a strong, sweet smell, but only at night, which is the perfect time to attract moths. Amazing, huh? So, the moths, having been attracted, will be able to pollinate the jasmine plants. And that's nature at work. All right, now, the professor this time very kindly said how flowers attract pollinators. So that's what you're going to say for the beginning and ending sentences, okay? If this happens, please don't miss it. Please, seize the opportunity. Take advantage of it. All right, so our first and last impressions should be perfect and flawless, okay? Now, the first part says, one major attractor is appearance because see colors well. For example, uh, yeah, I wrote down BF, but you shouldn't be saying best friend or boyfriend, right? It was butterflies. Butterflies are attracted to red and yellow, the colors red and yellow. You can choose to say the colors or not, it's fine. And the painted daisy has red petals and a yellow center. So irresistible to butterflies. Okay, the second section. Odor is also a common attractor because colorblind and only recognize scents. For example, moths are attracted to sweet smells and the jasmine produces a strong sweet smell only at night. Now, I originally wanted to add something like, uh, in other words, uh, the moth usually pollinates the jasmine because of this smell, but I'm not gonna even say it. Now. If I happen to have more than or around 15 seconds left by the time I'm done summarizing the lecture's information, I now have the freedom or the ability to say four names in the end. Butterflies, the painted daisy, moths, and the jasmine. Do you see? Now, but if I only had to choose two, flowers, this is the main character. I'm going to say the painted daisy and the jasmine, all right? And that's going to be entirely based on how many seconds I actually have left. If I have about 20 seconds left, I'm going to say all four names. Whereas, if I only have about 15 seconds left, I'm just going to say the flowers. Understand? All right, let's listen to my sample response. The professor gave a lecture about how flowers attract pollinators. To begin with, one major attractor is appearance because most insects can see colors well. For example, butterflies are attracted to the colors red and yellow, and the painted daisy has red petals and a yellow center. In other words, this flower is irresistible to butterflies. Furthermore, odor is another common attractor that is utilized because some insects are colorblind and can only recognize different scents. For instance, Moths are attracted to sweet smells, and the jasmine produces a strong sweet smell only at night. In summation, this was how flowers attract pollinators, which was illustrated by the painted daisy and the jasmine, given by the professor in the lecture. Thank you for your time and consideration. Okay, now, this is honestly something that I didn't do on purpose at all. This just happened by accident. So I think I said... Odor is another common attractor that is used. So I just, I had to improvise it because I went off the script, all right? Um, I should have said, odor is another, odor is also, here I go again, odor is, a, is also a common attractor. I should have said that, but I went off script, went off script, and uh, fortunately was able to improvise properly. Um, I'm emphasizing this because that's gonna happen to you sometimes. And when it does, don't freak out. Roll with the punches and play it by ear. You got to be able to act on your toes, okay? Think on your feet because sometimes, although you have great notes on your piece of paper, you might say something um, out of habit, all right? 
And when that happens, don't panic. Okay, um, those were the sample responses that I wanted to show you. Please, my sample responses are always leaning towards um, an approach that's more realistic and thus more consistent, okay? You don't have to say everything that you hear from the lecture because it's impossible and it's really demanding. Um, if the TOEFL happened to be a test that is only administered to English, native English speakers, then yeah, the benchmark and the standards would be much higher than they actually are right now. But since that's not the case, since the TOEFL is um, a test that is literally testing uh, the level of fluency of a second language, it's, it's not necessary for you guys to try to organize everything that you hear and understand because that's not what, what's expected to be done, all right? Okay, um, in the next video, we're gonna be covering integrated writing. So if that question, if that task is giving you a lot of trouble, please stay tuned and be sure to check it out. Peace.